All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Soren Greffenstedt, and I am uh, the Associate Program Director here at the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government. Thank you all for joining us. Um, it is our uh, great delight to have Professor Bejan here today. Um, before we begin, I would just like to thank our co-sponsor for this event, the Program of Liberal Studies. Uh, it is our tradition in the center to have one of our undergraduate student fellows introduce our speaker. So um, in a moment, I will ask Sarah to join us to do that. Sarah is a sophomore from Texas. She's double majoring in theology and the program of liberal studies, and she is one of our undergraduate Tocqueville fellows. So please join me in, me in welcoming Sarah to the podium. Good afternoon. It is my pleasure to introduce our visiting speaker today. Teresa Bejan is a professor of political theory and a fellow of Oriel College at the University of Oxford. She joined the faculty in Oxford after leaving the University of Toronto in 2015. Professor Bejan's research brings historical perspectives to bear on questions in contemporary political theory. She has written extensively on themes of free speech, civility, tolerance, and equality in historical contexts ranging from ancient Athens to contemporary analytic philosophy. Alongside her academic work, Professor Bejan writes regularly for popular media outlets, including the New York Times, The Atlantic, and The Washington Post. Her first book, Mere Civility, Disagreement and the Limits of Toleration, published in 2017, is the topic of her lecture today. Please join me in welcoming Professor Bejan. Hello. Welcome. Um, I'm really, I have to say, I've, I've been just blown away by the attendance. I know that there's a free lunch, and I also know there's no such thing as a free lunch. So now you've got to listen to me. But I'm really, uh, it's clear that this is just a really uh, flourishing uh, community and context. And I'm just really thrilled to be able to speak to you all. Uh, well, thank you uh, for that very kind introduction. I've been invited to speak to you here today as an expert of sorts on civility. It's an altogether dubious distinction, I feel. Uh, as was mentioned, my, my reputation as an expert stems from the fact that in 2017, I published a book about civility. Or more specifically, I published a book about early modern European debates about civility and religious toleration, in which I gestured towards what those debates might have to tell us about um, contemporary controversies over free speech, civility, and tolerance. And I think that um, the success of that book has something to do with the fact that it was published right after the 2016 <laughs> presidential election. Normally, academic monographs about early modern intellectual history don't get reviewed in the New York Times and these other venues. But I think there was something about my timing that worked out rather well. The embarrassing thing was that, like many first books for academics, my book, Mere Civility, was based on my PhD thesis, which I'd been working on for a very long time. So what seemed very timely when it came out had actually been um, germinating for quite a while. So, so there you go. That's the foundation of my civility expertise. And at that time, it was in high demand. And five years later, I find that little has changed. The civility crisis in American politics proceeds apace. As an expert, I still get invitations to come to speak to audiences like this one. And the first thing I tell those audiences, in which I'll tell you, is that there are few perennials in politics as predictable as a crisis of civility. And the problem in American politics began long before 2016. Um, I started my PhD in, 20, in 2007, I think. And so when I was thinking about civility, I was thinking about it in the context of Obama's first inaugural, which by the time the book came out was rather uh, distant history. But in any case, over the past few decades, um, crises of civility have become permanent afflictions, not only in the United States, but in liberal democracies across the world. And that includes societies like the, U the United Kingdom, where I live now, where in Canada, where I lived before. And these are societies that uh, all define themselves by their aspiration to be tolerant societies, as well as free societies. 
So I think the context of these crises of civility is really important. They happen in tolerant and free societies, or at least places that aspire to be both tolerant and free. And in such societies, the crisis of civility tends to turn around one increasingly controversial freedom in particular. That is the freedom of speech. And in these societies, whenever the national conversation gets heated, people begin to raise their voices, disagreements become disagreeable, and then the calls for conversational virtue begin. Right? Can't we be civil, at least? And those calls for civility are met very quickly indeed by the eye rolls from the civility skeptics who are ever suspicious that the self-appointed guardians of civil discourse are ever more concerned to silence their opponents than to have an actual civil debate. And who can blame the skeptics, really? Uh, while civility's boosters will always insist on the profound importance of what the members of tolerant societies say to each other, as well as how we say it, the skeptics note that as a solution to the problems that face our deeply divided democracies, Mere civility seems like a fairly inadequate solution, right? At best, inadequate. And at worst, we might actually think that mere civility would be counterproductive. After all, why on earth should we think that talking to each other at length about the issues that divide us most deeply uh, should bring us closer together at all? Why would we think that talking about our differences is a good idea in the first place? Surely the tolerant thing to do would be simply to agree to disagree, to accept our differences, bite our tongues, and move on. And if the differences are such that we simply can't move on, that we simply can't get past them, well, then we'd certainly just better recognize up front that a civil disagreement simply isn't on the cards, right? And that other strategies might be required, strategies such as censorship, silencing, exclusion, suppression, that we might very well want to have these strategies on the table. And I mean, if anything, since the book came out five years ago, I think recent political developments have attuned us now more than ever to not only the downside, but the dark side of civility. Increasingly, we're told that in the face of injustice, not only is silence violence, but good manners are tantamount to complicity. Right? Now critics on all sides of the political spectrum claim that civility isn't a virtue at all. It's actually a vice, one that demands deference to the establishment, to the elite, while delegitimizing dissent and in silencing and excluding already marginal voices. Now, since I began working on the topic over 10 years ago, it strikes me that public suspicion of civility is actually at an all-time high on both sides of the political spectrum. Now, I know it's very unfashionable to say both sides, be accused of both sidesism, but yes, both sides of the political spectrum. And although people on opposite sides of the political spectrum tend to disagree about who's marginalized, who's silenced, and who's excluded, actually, the analysis of the dark side of civility, I think, is the same. Conversational virtue is used as a way to silence and suppress the disagreeable people and the disagreeable views that we don't want to be heard. Um, so yeah, on all sides, we have, uh, it's increasingly sort of, uh, it's become explicit, I think, that was something that was implicit when I first started working on the topic, that um, the idea that the time for civil disagreement is over, the time for righteous outrage, shutting down, tirelessly calling out our opponents has begun. And on this view, what our tolerant and free society needs is more incivility and our leaders and their followers are always happy to oblige. Still, for all the moral clarity on all sides of these debates, I can't help but notice that a fatal fuzziness remains. Namely, what exactly is civility? <laughs> it's amazing to me how rarely activists on all sides are able or willing to ask themselves what is this thing that they claim to be a vice? What is this thing that others claim to be a virtue? It's not a question that's often asked, but I sort of submit to you that it's one that bears serious reflection. Of course, I would say that because I'm a political theorist and I've spent a lot of time thinking about what it means. But in any case, the common sense answer, I think, 
is that civility is simply another word for politeness, for good manners. This is a view that I've already alluded to in my comments thus far. Uh, to be civil means to be respectful, to be courteous. But upon reflection, I think it's clear that to be uncivil is a lot worse <laughs> than being impolite. And that civility, too, also has some other curious features that distinguish it from these other conversational virtues um, that we tend to have in mind. So if we want to be more precise, I think we can say that civility is a conversational virtue akin to politeness, to courtesy, or respect. But unlike those other virtues, civility is meant to govern one kind of conversation in particular. That is, it concerns itself not only with how we speak to each other, but more precisely, how we disagree. So civility applies to disagreements in particular, and that's important. As the 17th century philosopher Thomas Hobbes liked to point out, there's a reason that the word disagreeable is a synonym for unpleasant in English, right? He tells us in his 1642 work, De Kive, quote, the mere act of disagreement is offensive because not to agree with someone on an issue is tacitly to accuse him of error. Just as to disagree with him from a large number of points is tantamount to calling him a fool. So basically Hobbes is pointing to here the fact that disagreements are disagreeable because they have this ineluctable element of insult implicit in them. Every disagreement, at least implicitly, is an accusation against your opponent that they've reasoned incorrectly or worse, that they're interested, malign, maybe they're insane, right? If disagreement itself is difficult due to its insulting nature, the conversational virtue of civility is especially salient to disagreements where the issues at stake are ones that we consider to be somehow particularly fundamental, that is to our worldviews as well as to our personal and social identities. You know the kinds of questions I mean. I mean those are issues of religion, of politics, of culture, our identity that go straight to the heart of how we see the world and how we see ourselves in relation to those with whom we share this world. These are the commitments that people really seriously disagree about and those disagreements become heated and hateful because we define ourselves and our opponents in the course of having that disagreement. And so civility here, when we appeal to civility in the context of that kind of fundamental disagreement, we're calling for a sort of virtuous self-restraint that's meant to keep those disagreeable disagreements peaceful, right? So that the disputants can continue to use their words and not resort to swords. Or I guess people don't have swords anymore, but you know, resort to fisticuffs. So there we have civility in the sense of peaceful as a kind of pacifying of disagreement. And I think that its role in pacifying conflict leads us to the second peculiar feature of civility. So in contrast with other conversational virtues like politeness, respect, et cetera, civility is distinguished, I think, by its minimal character and occasionally even its negative overtones as a low bar grudgingly met. It's thus possible to be merely civil in a way that it's not really possible to be merely polite or merely courteous or merely respectful, right? When we call for more civility from our opponents, we have something less than deference or respect in mind. As a conversational virtue, civility seems to be at home in the uneasy relations between ex-partners, bad neighbors, as well as members of the other party or religious sect. And we might, as I do, simply call this virtue mere civility. Right? And those of you who have ever been on the receiving end of merely civil behavior will know that often merely civil behavior is a way of communicating to someone that you don't respect them. <laughs> it's, really a it's really efficient way of communicating contempt. So again, that seems to distinguish civility from these other conversational virtues. But finally, I think uh, there's a third uh, distinguishing feature of civility, and it's really important. And it has to do to the, what we might call the agents and the subjects of civility. So consider the many cognates of the word civility in English, words like civic, civilian, civilization, citizen. All of these are clues that the, the modern English word civility is derived from the Latin word civitas, meaning the body of citizens or state. 
And this derivation suggests that civility as a virtue isn't intended to govern disagreements between just anyone, but that its proper practitioners are those who stand in a particular relation to one another. That is, those who live together and share a civil society. They needn't necessarily all be citizens. It's not necessarily a co-citizen relation. Nevertheless, it's a kind of, it's a virtue that applies to those who share membership in this thing we call a civil society. They share a life and they share a future or fate. So taking these three features together, then I think we can define civility as follows. Civility is the conversational virtue that we expect um, from all members of a civil society as such. And it's meant to regulate the fundamental disagreements between them. And so defining in that way can then help us see that why civility seems to be particularly important in tolerant and free societies. It seems that without the virtue of civility, such societies are really going to struggle with the problems of coexistence because these are societies that are in themselves committed to the toleration of fundamental disagreements between their members. So far from being a kind of thin hope to hang our hopes, a th thin branch to hang our hopes on, it seems that civility is really important indeed. But I also think this definition of civility in, uh, in pointing out these three features helps us explain why, despite the widespread assumption that civility is just a synonym for politeness, being labeled uncivil is so profoundly um, threatening, that being uncivil is worse than being polite. Because it's a signal to the recipient when we call someone uncivil, that that person is somehow beyond the pale of our civil society, that they may be or at least should not be a member of our tolerant, free, and civil society, or at least not a member in good standing, right? So the phrase beyond the pale, which I've just used, I, you've heard this phrase before, beyond the pale, we all know this phrase. Do we know where this phrase comes from? Some people do. <laughs> beyond the pale is really instructive because in ancient Latin, the pale refers to a, a, a fence post or stake. So the idea of someone being beyond the pale means they're a person who lives beyond the fence, beyond the boundary of a civilized society, i.e. the person who's beyond the pale is a barbarian and sort of in themselves a threat to the possibility of a kind of civil shared existence. And of course, the most famous historical example of a pale is, and one I think that will probably be known to many of the people here, is, is the Pale of Dublin, right? Which separated the so-called savage Irish Catholics from the civilized Anglo-Protestants who lived uh, within the city, right? And that's a legacy. So the phrase beyond the pale is a legacy of English colonialism in Ireland. So critics of civility, I think, are right to point out that when we call someone uncivil, we're engaging in what's sort of known in the biz as a civilizing discourse. We're sort of suggesting that they're savage, that they're barbarous, and that we are sort of models of civility and um, right speaking. And so calling someone uncivil naturally suggests that they are in a way intolerable, right? That they represent a kind of threat to civil society. The uncivil person cannot and should not be respected. They should not be listened to. They should instead be silenced, excluded, or suppressed as a threat. So critics, I think, are very good on this. They're very aware of the ways in which civility talk has this kind of civilizational implication. But interestingly, I think critics of civility are less attuned to the ways in which uncivil behavior itself communicates the same message. So if I refuse to be merely civil to you, that has the same kind of exclusionary effect. Uncivil treatment is, after all, not just unpleasant for those on the receiving end. Like calling someone uncivil, treating them uncivilly is an indication that the disagreement is over. No further conversation is possible. A person who diagnosed this sort of weird feature of civility, both calling someone uncivil and being uncivil as, as, as themselves sort of accomplishing the same end, is John Locke in his thoughts concerning education. He says, the most uncivil thing a young man can do is accuse someone else of incivility. In any case, in modern liberal democracies like the US, societies that aspire to be tolerant as well as civil and free, it's no surprise then that we've come to see civility as essential. 
It's the virtue that's meant to enable us not only to differ, but to really disagree and to freely speak our minds and nevertheless live together and share a life despite the inevitable disagreeableness. But on the flip side of every civil disagreement remains this specter of suppression and exclusion, the suspicion that those who fail to meet the bar of even mere civility have no place in our tolerant society. And we worry that to be civil to those, to those people is itself to tolerate those who do not deserve it and who in a way pose a threat. I think sometimes when I, when I give lectures, I like to bring in here uh, this, you know, Karl Popper's paradox of tolerance. This is widely memed these days. It's terrible. I, he's, 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 Popper's just so, but, anyway, but this is a sort of intuitive idea that we shouldn't tolerate the intolerant because if we tolerate the intolerant, they'll destroy the possibility of our tolerant society. I think you get the same kind of arguments in civility. We shouldn't be civil to the uncivil lest we destroy our civil society in the process. Okay, so much for the kind of theoretical analysis. Let's turn now to the history. In my book, I argue that the first modern crisis of civility was kicked off by none other than Martin Luther, who made himself a master of that recent revolution in communications technology, the printing press. Think of it like Twitter, but more disruptive. So when the Pope responds to Luther's 95 theses by declaring 41 of them heretical, Luther responded quite reasonably by calling the Pope the Antichrist. <laughs> and later, Luther would announce himself, quote, unable to pray without at the same time cursing. If I'm prompted to say, hallowed be thy name, he wrote, I must add cursed, damned, and outraged be the name of the papists, unquote. So the longstanding tradition uh, within Protestantism of calling Catholics papists or anti-Christians, as they must be since they follow the papal antichrist, right, begins here, right at the beginning. But lest you think I'm going easy on the Catholics because of this context, they too gave as good as they got, but with traditional labels like heretic or schismatic. And in fact, the term Protestant itself starts out as an insult, as a slur against these rather loud, uh, disagreeable Christians in, in the fold. When Leo X excommunicates Luther in 1521, he, go, he went even further. He bestowed upon Martin's followers the insulting denomination Lutheran so that they might share in Martin's punishment and shame. So again, Lutheran is a slur. Then as now many critics, including Desiderius Erasmus, would accuse Luther of lowering the conversational tone and violating the standard of civility. But Luther retorted that the truth would always be offensive to those privileged by an unjust status quo. Right? Quote, you can't turn the sword into a feather, said Luther, and the word of God is a sword. And here he was on good, uh, good Greek foundations. Right? The Greek word evangel simply means a shout. Right? So here I think an early evangelical Christianity after the Reformation, or we could just call it shouty Christianity. In shouty Christianity, we see the roots of a, a tradition I like to call free speech fundamentalism. And I think it's not unfamiliar to Americans, this tradition of uh, free, free speech fundamentalism. Um, this kind of Christian religion seems to pose a problem for coexistence in particular because it insisted that it was a matter of religious practice to speak truth to power without fear or favor and no matter how offensive. And sometimes it even seemed to argue that actually the more offensive, the better, because that was an indication of the truthfulness <laughs> of what one was saying. So in the 16th and 17th centuries, many self-described evangelicals took Luther's advice to heart. My favorite example comes from 17th century England in the early Quakers who experimented with many deliberately offensive forms of enthusiastic speech. The Quakers and other sectarians coupled this free speech fundamentalism with a principled critique of civility itself. Like Luther, the Quakers argued that a truly evangelical Christian had a duty to protest and thus to offend the sensibilities of the society of which they were part, which was necessarily corrupt. And on this view, any conversational virtue was simply a cover for hypocrisy, so one writer argues, quote, civility doth but wash the outside. The inwards must be washed. A pig may be washed, yet a pig still, right? So this is sort of origin of the, you can't put lipstick on a pig, right? You know, civility, a civil pig is still a pig, right? By contrast, the spirit of protest at the heart of Protestantism demanded conscientious incivility, 
in the form of disruptive witness against the powers that happened to be. And the Quakers were really good at this. They did things like take off their clothes in public for a sign, disrupt Anglican church services by banging pots and pans. And in my favorite example, a Quaker man reportedly took off his pants and lay down on the communion table, right? Because uncivil protest against the corruption of the Anglican church. Crisis of civility indeed. We, we, we have it easy these days. So today we tend to think of religious toleration as the obvious solution to this problem of kind of evangelical disagreement. But history again reminds us of just how not obvious the solution of toleration was. From the perspective of the participants, Protestant, uh, pro Protestant speech, free speech, or what some of its critics like to call persecution of the tongue, seemed to be just as pressing a danger as other forms of persecution, those of sword and stake. And far from being a solution, it seemed that tolerating these uncivil disagreements was simply a surefire way of making the problem worse by bringing evangelists into close contact and then encouraging them to compete. So why would we tolerate this kind of religious difference and disagreement? It just seems like a recipe for civil war. Thus, by the mid-17th century in England, the consensus among dissenters was that civility was simply the watchword of the would-be persecutor, nothing more, right? So anyone who was talking about civility was mainly concerned with getting these evangelicals to shut up. It's familiar, right? Um, <laughs> those like Hobbes, right, who basically thought that any, any tolerance of this kind of uh, uncivil speech um, would necessarily lead to conflict and then to civil war. And so the idea that you know, a civil society could not and, and, and could never be a tolerant society, right? The permission of any religious difference would lead to uncivil disagreement, mutual offense, and then the whole thing would fall apart. Lucky for us, however, a few Protestants dared to challenge that consensus, and one man in particular, uh, a man called Roger Williams. So raise your hand if you've heard of Roger Williams before. Oh, brilliant, okay. <laughs> Even though Roger Williams shared his fellow evangelical's suspicion of civility and civility talk in his day, he nevertheless thought that unmurderous coexistence would be possible in a tolerant society, so long as something he called mere civility would uh, could be cultivated and put in place. And of course, the mereness of mere civility for Williams is not just a kind of mereness in the sense of being low, but also mereness in this early modern sense of the mere as the pure, as the unmixed, right? So pure civility, okay. So what does this look like on Williams's model? Well, I think before I get there, I have to tell you just how unlikely a defender of civility Roger Williams was. And to know that, you have to know a little bit about where he came from. So like most Puritans, Williams left England in the 1630s because he'd had enough of living in a society of sinners. He wanted to live in a society of saints. And like many uh, young idealistic men, he thought the si society of saints was synonymous with Boston. So he moved to Boston. <laughs> Because he thought, persuaded by John Winthrop, that Boston would be the city on a hill, right, and a model of Christian charity apart from and above all of these corrupt societies around him. I mean, you can guess, you've already laughed, you can guess how that went. But in any case, Williams was immediately disappointed by what he found in Massachusetts Bay. Before he even arrived, he began to see that those he called the unchristian Christians of New England were hypocrites. They ostentatiously condemned and cried out against the sins of others, all the while perpetuating pious frauds, above all the expropriation of the American Indians. And actually, uh, Williams publishes a pamphlet uh, accusing the New English of stealing from the Americans. And you can imagine that that did not endear him to his neighbors. But that was not his only offensive opinion. In addition to floating the suggestion that women should wear veils in public, he preached against the sinfulness of swearing oaths, and his followers were actually caught defacing an English flag, so climbing up on a roof and cutting out the cross of St. George because they thought it was an, un, uh, 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 an unacceptable violation of the, what he calls the wall of separation between civil and uh, state, uh, so, so civil and church signs. So no wonder his fellow colonists wanted to get rid of him. It seems that Roger Williams committed the sin of being too Puritan for his fellow Puritans. And on top of that, he was an evangelical Puritan Christian. He saw it as his duty to witness 
tirelessly and vehemently, in his own words, to his neighbors about what he saw as their spiritual errors. And he was at this for years before his fellow uh, New English finally decided to exile him. I think sometimes we hear the story of Roger Williams' banishment and we're like, oh God, this is so bad, they banished him. He was doing this for years. They put up with him for years, <laughs> okay? I'm not saying they were right. I'm just saying I understand, right? <laughs> So finally, they choose to banish Williams for his incivility. Today, I think people would describe someone like Roger Williams as a virtuoso of what we call hate speech, right? So Williams never called Catholics Catholics. He always called them anti-Christians. Similarly, <laughs> the American Indians were always pagans or barbarians, and he made it very clear that he viewed their religion as idolatry and even outright devil worship. Nevertheless, Williams insisted that there was more civility to be found among the American barbarians than among the unchristian Christians of New England. And he would later plead for re religious toleration on behalf of the Narragansett to Parliament itself, which goes back to England and pleads for toleration on the Americans' behalf. And this experience, I think, helps um, explain why Williams, unlike other Protestants, uh, some of whom were demanding or sort of advocating for religious toleration at the time, Williams never rejects civility. He takes a different tack. So when he's exiled from Massachusetts Bay, he's actually sheltered by the Narragansett. He becomes convinced that even those who disagree on the fundamentals of faith and who are mutually intolerant of each other's errors, nevertheless can share a common life. They can share a civil society. He had learned the hard way, he wrote, quote, that one must go out of the world if one would not keep converse with idolaters, right? And so the true Christian has no choice but to tolerate idolatry because it's everywhere she looks. And so when he founded his own colony, what would become Rhode Island, he proposed to tolerate not only American pagans, as well as Jews and Muslims and every variety of Protestant Christian. No, most shockingly of all, he proposes to tolerate Catholics. And just to, just to give you a sense of how radical that was, I mean, we're talking about 1640s, when John Locke publishes his letter concerning toleration in 1689, one of the, he excludes two groups. He excludes atheists and Catholics, right? This idea that you could actually allow a Catholic in your tolerant society was, was extremely shocking. Williams was arguing for that in 1644. For, for, for Williams, the point was that, quote, if men keep but the bond of civility, all might live together despite their spiritual oppositions. But of course, this brings us again to the question, okay, well, what does Williams mean by civility? It's clear, I hope, that he doesn't mean that if men can be but polite. No, that was not what we had in mind. As a tireless and often obnoxious evangelist, Williams knew from experience how uncivil evangelism can feel to those on the receiving end. Yet unlike Luther, Williams refused to reserve the right to be offensive to the righteous alone. And this is the key, right? Civility, like religious truth, he insisted, would always be in the eye of the beholder, quote, that ourselves and all men are apt and prone to differ, that either party or is most right in his own eye, his cause right, his carriage right, his arguments right, his answers right, is no new thing in all the former ages of the world, right? So this basic Williams insight that not all indignations are equally righteous, yet all indignations are experienced equally righteously. Right? And any theory or practice of civility is going to have to take that seriously. For Williams, this meant that civility could not be a matter of policing other speech or avoiding controversial topics. Rather, mere or pure civility, as he saw it, was a practice of toleration. It was the willingness to hold one's nose and remain present to one's opponents, no matter how intolerable or indeed deplorable he found their views. And crucially, it wasn't just to sort of tolerate as put up with, it was also a commitment to talking about those views, talking about their errors with other people. That is, to their faces, 
and not behind their backs. And to do so ideally, if you're Roger Williams, until they recognize that you, not they, are right. Okay, so there are a couple steps. Um, Williams' notion of mere civility was thus a frankly evangelical virtue. The essence, I think, of it can be reduced to this idea that the civil person will tolerate above all other people's incivility. And to say that the success of Williams' uh, civil society, right, his lively experiment in Rhode Island, uh, was not foregone is, to put it mildly, uh, contemporaries called Rhode Island Rogue's Island. Another one called it the latrine of New England. It's pretty evocative. The self-styled saints next door were constantly complaining that Williams' colony had become a receptacle for all sorts of riffraff. And apart from the normal challenges of life on the colonial frontier, what was really exceptional about Rhode Island was the absence of any kind of established church. Indeed, Rhode Island welcomed Protestants of all stripes, Jews, Muslims, American pagans, and even Catholic anti-Christians to live together on terms of equal liberty. And this is really crucial. It, it, also, terms of equal liberty to proselytize, right? In Williams' colony, as long as one was willing to practice mere civility by fighting for the faith with words, not swords, no one was beyond the pale, not even the Quakers, although they did test his tolerance. But in the end, he said, no, we can tell the players. So forget the founding. In my book, I argue that if we want to understand the United States' peculiar tradition of free speech fundamentalism, we've really got to look to the 17th century, to the influx of evangelical, evangelical Protestants like Williams to the American colonies, and their commitment to seeing kind of free speech as a non-negotiable part of their religious practice. This means that Rhode Island was not the kind of multicultural idyll imagined by some modern liberals. Still, for over a century, Rogue's Island would remain the most tolerant society the world had ever seen. And I think Williams did this by challenging what people like Karl Popper present as obvious, namely this idea that tolerant societies can't tolerate the intolerant. Williams knew from experience that a tolerant society cannot pick and choose its materials and remain tolerant for long. Indeed, he remained committed to tolerance in its original sense, the idea of tolerantia, the idea of sort of putting up with an acknowledged evil. For medieval Catholic theologians, the acknowledged evils included things like sewage, prostitutes, and Jews, right? You must tolerate these evils in your society, lest in extirpating the sin, you extirpate the society. And I think that this vision of a tolerant society as one of uncomfortable inclusion, where we confront our differences and commit ourselves to tolerating the incivility of others, rests on a radical and in some ways, frankly, unreasonable faith in the possibility of sharing a common life with those we find it difficult, if maybe even sometimes impossible, to respect. Still, I think that in today's ongoing crises of tolerance and civility, we have a lot to learn from people like Roger Williams, especially when we encounter more and more people who, like the early Quakers, are tempted to kind of give up on civil disagreement altogether because they fear that the soul of the nation is at stake. I think critics of civility are right, that a civil society will not necessarily be a just society. Still, mere civility holds out the hope that the members of a tolerant society will be able to work together to make their society more just over time, despite their deep disagreements and dislike. Mere civility on Williams' model is not an ob obstacle to crying out against injustice. Indeed, that's the whole point, is it's a theory of civility that allows us to call each other out. But it does demand that when we do call each other out, that we do so without denying or destroying the possibility of a common life tomorrow with those we see as standing in our way today. And so if you're talking about civility as a way to avoid having those difficult disagreements. I think Williams would say that you're doing civility wrong. And if you're tempted to valorize incivility, on the other hand, right, to make it a virtue and to make civility the vice, well, I think you're probably forgetting that it's rarely the powerful or privileged whose voices will be drowned out. It will always be those who are already disadvantaged and marginal. And so practiced by Roger Williams, mere civility reminds us that the temptation to achieve a tolerant society through exclusion, by pushing those we believe to be uncivil beyond the pale, that's a constant temptation. We need to be careful that we're not more concerned to avoid the disagreeableness of disagreement, preferring to preach to the converted, 
to isolate ourselves among the like-minded, to try to create our own society of saints, whether on a college campus or online, right? And remember that actually unmurderous coexistence with the intolerant infidel next door is no picnic, but neither is the society of saints. So in any case, I think Williams thought that the proponent of a tolerant society based on something like mere civility will have to remain committed to talking while disagreeing, to engaging without convincing, and thus to tolerating in this traditional sense. And so to return to the 21st century and our own aspirationally tolerant and civil societies, I think it's worth remembering, and I say this to my students, it sounds glib, but it's just true. Infidels are people too. The intolerant are people too. Right? Continued engagement with them on terms of mere civility may be all we can hope for. Still, it's no less important and miraculous for all of that. And so I say, two cheers for mere civility. I think we'll miss it when it's gone. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Bejan. That was wonderful. We have some time for a few questions. Uh, and we have a tradition of asking one of our undergraduates to go first. Um, we ask that you wait for the microphone and then stand up, introduce yourself, and then ask the first question. Um, first question goes to the first one here, Walter. Hi, I'm Walter. I'm a political science student. I'm a freshman. Uh, my question is, uh, at the end of the social contract, Rousseau asserts that the civil and theological intolerance are inseparable. He said it is impossible to live in peace with people whom believes to be damned. My question is, does mere civility look like for Catholics on the issue of abortion? <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'll speak to Rousseau and then I'll speak to the, the left turn you, you took at the end of that. So. Yeah, I think that that phrase, that, that line from the social contract is really important. Um, so what, what Rousseau says in the social contract is that it's impossible to live in peace with those one regards as damned, right? And I think that that's very often presented as kind of just commonsensical. But what really gets me excited about early modern evangelicals and tolerationists like Williams is that they just give the lie to that statement. It's not impossible to live in peace with those you regard as damned. I mean, Williams did it every day. And in fact, tolerant society seems to seem to depend on people's willingness to do that, right? So I like to say that you know Rhode Island simply empirically falsifies <laughs> Rousseau's claim. Let's take the second um, horn of Walter's dilemma. I, I think the Williams's view is that in a in a tolerant and civil society, you are going to be called to put up with things you regard as morally reprehensible. And so the example that he gives is when he's engaging in um, trade and diplo diplomacy with local American tribes. Um, the diplomatic uh, convention is to exchange trophies from the dead, that is sort of scalps, body parts, right? And Williams, as a Christian, finds this completely reprehensible. But he thinks that it's actually, in, in kind of creating a shared life, he had to accept these, right? And so again, it's the classic sense of, actually, toler toleration is no joke. You're going to be called to tolerate evils. Right? Um, not an answer, but, uh, but an anecdote. Testing, oh, <laughs> yuck, all right. Um, it seems like the demand for civility in a context where the issue of dispute primarily refers to the other world versus civility in a 20th, 21st century context where the warring faiths are much more concrete political arrangements kind of situation. Like the, the, the demands of civility seem to change. And I wonder if that, maybe even just the psychological, no, but yeah, I mean, it's, it doesn't seem like it's exactly the same mm. thing. And I wonder if you think that the problem changes at all. Well, I'd be a bad historian of political thought if I told you, Linus, that it's exactly the same in the 21st century as the 17th century. No, of course it is, and it can't be. But what I would argue is actually that the, there are really striking parallels with the 17th century debates and 21st century ones. One of which, simply to point out, is that this kind of distinction between sort of this worldly disagreements and otherworldly disagreements is not really that easy to make because precisely what 
Williams and his New English uh, fellows were arguing about in the New World was how are you going to constitute a Christian society? I mean, so these are precisely issues of governance, um, constitutional arrangements, the the you know the the implication of church and state, or whether or not you're going to separate. So I, again, I mean. <laughs> I'm always looking for excuses to ignore the 18th century, but this is why it was one of the ways in which I think 17th century disagreements are really helpful because they allow us to see that, you know, the the line between kind of religious disagreements and political disagreements just can't be can't, can't be drawn. Political disagreements are religious, religious disagreements are political, and that means that actually there's a familiarity to the problems. Uh, hi, thanks, Luke Foster. I'm a, I'm a postdoc upstairs with, with the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government. Um, I, I want to ask if on William's view or on the use you're making of William's view, however much those two can be separated, um, is there any legitimacy to thinking of politics as a quest for home uh, or a place of belonging, mm -hmm. a place of where you recognize the way things are done and you feel um, familiarity or, or, or rootedness there, right? It seems like the emphasis on mere civility and the sort of hold your nose kind of toleration, it might be pragmatic or workable, but it, it would ex have to exclude those kind of, the, the idea of uh, my, my citizenship is a place where I, I recognize how things are done and I feel like one of the people or part of the, 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 the group. It's an excellent question and I, I think that um there's no difference between what Williams would think and what I would say that he thinks for the purposes of a, of a contemporary argument. Firstly, Luke. Uh, <laughs> secondly, yeah, I think that the view is one wherein po po the politics of the, of the worldly city it, it will never be home. Home is home, right? And I mean, the, the, one of the interesting things about Williams is nor did he think that the church could be a home. I mean, I, it's a notable thing about Williams that, you know, there was never a church that, that he would join and then not leave. At the end of his life, he's worshiping in a congregation of two with his wife, and he's not sure. He's not sure about her. Um, <laughs> so there is this kind of um, idea of, of the pilgrim or peregrination, right? We are just, you know, we're, we're, he's, at one point he compares uh, the Christian to a poor grasshopper clinging to the leaf in the veil of tears. Um, but what, what I find so interesting about Williams is that he has that really kind of, you know, Augustinian sense, really, of, of, of the pilgrim in, in, in the worldly city. But at the same time, he really values the peace of the city and the kind of contingency of the ways in which we, you know, we do things here. He holds those customs at, hard, at arm's length. Nevertheless, he sees that they're worth preserving, right? And so, you know, I alluded to his beef with the Quakers. I mean, William's frustration with the Quakers is that not only are they sort of, you know, critiquing civility in theory, saying civility is a vice, not a virtue, they're just unwilling to abide by the norms of civil interaction in the New English co colonies. Instead of, he, he complains that instead of uh, giving each other the good Christian kiss hello, they insist on this barbarous practice of grabbling and shaking of the hand. Right? Just even when it comes to just these sort of ceremonies of politeness, they, they won't respect the kind of ways of, of, of the community in which they find themselves. And he finds that deeply disturbing. Thank you very much. That was very enjoyable. Uh, I'm Shasta. I'm a second year political science PhD student. Um, so I have a two-parter. The first is, do you think that human beings are naturally predisposed to being civil to one another? And uh, is comedy by its nature, uncivil. And uh, the second part of this has to do with... There was one question, actually, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so the second part of this has to do with the idea that you mentioned that dissenters don't like the idea of civil civility because in part what dissent attempts to do is to restructure political norms. And yet, as you frame it, civility is a minimal standard and you can see why you have to abide by it if you want to criticize but not deconstruct something. Um, despite all of this, it still means that the burden of being civil seems to be heavier for the dissenter. Yeah. And do you think this is a problem for democratic discourse? And would acknowledging this disparity make the conversation easier? Or would then the conversation shift to 
figuring out who the dissenter is. Mm. Yeah, excellent. Um, uh, well, to take the first question first, is civility natural? No. Okay. <laughs> to take the second question, second, second. Uh, yeah, no, so I, I think that there is, uh, you know, Williams is thinking and in, in writing in the context of all these great 17th century debates about natural sociability and the extent to does human nature associate or dissociate? And I think he's closer to Hobbes than he is to someone like uh, Hooker or Pufendorf, right? He, he, no, he thinks nature dissociates. And so civility is actually a kind of miraculous achievement. And we can't take for granted the goods of peace. And it makes sense that he would think that too, having had this experience of you know, constantly being rejected by the societies that are getting set up in the new world and having to start his own, right? You know, the context there, I think, helps. Uh, secondly, is comedy necessarily uncivil? I haven't thought about this. I'm inclined to say no, but to say no to, in a way to acknowledge that there's such thing as bad comedy. Is good comedy necessarily uncivil? Maybe. But I'll have to think about that more. Um, and just the third question, which I think is really is the key question, and that's sort of where I'm turning now in my, in my work, is um, I mean, I'm, I, I, I make a point of being really explicit in my book and in my, pub, in my public writing, I hope, to just make the point that the burdens of tolerance are not equally distributed. Everyone will be called upon to tolerate something, right, that they dislike. Nevertheless, it's the dissenter, it's the minority, it's those who, are not, who feel themselves least at home, to go back to Luke's kind of question, who are then call, you know, to called upon to tolerate more. And I think that it's, um, that's, to recognize that is not to say it's just, it's not to say it's necessary, certainly it's not to say it's good, but I think we'd rather, we should be clear-eyed about that fact. Now, but the, this turns me, my, my new book is about equality, right, and so my whole question about, you know, can we imagine societies where these burdens are equally distributed? And I, I tend, I guess, to be, pessimistic. I think what we need to do is to be aware of the disparities, aware of the inequalities, and think of ways to mitigate them, rather than, um, I think you said to, crit to deconstruct, wait, to, um, to, to disagree without deconstructing, was that your yeah, phrase? But yeah, but I would say, yeah, so to, criti to, yeah, to criticize without destroying. Right, I think that there's, when we talk about civility or theorize civility, I, I think I'm, you know, I would say we have to take seriously the idea that there's a status quo bias built into civility as a conversational virtue. It's all, always about kind of tipping our hat to the way that things are done, right? And that this is very offensive to dissenters. Um, but that, you know, that's why I'm very concerned to distinguish between civility as a conversational virtue and other virtues or principles that we might care about, namely justice. I think civility and justice can conflict, right? The question is, well, what role does civility play in holding societies together, anxieties that exist together so that they can then be rendered more just over time? So I think I, I, I would rather us just accept the sort of status quo bias to recognize it, to criticize it, but not to sort of say that, you know, that, that we can jettison it and not, not lose something really important. Uh, can you hear all right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's mathematics. Uh, I, I taught here for years in PLS, and uh, we would read some Euclid, and after about 10 propositions in Euclid, I do approve that nobody ever broke in that class uh, that all triangles on the same base have the same are have the same area, uh, and presented a proof. Everyone told me that was wrong. No one told me what was wrong with it. Well, I think in the history of mathematics, there's a lot of. <clears throat> developments like that and that might be an interesting area to try out what you're saying about civility is whether that always occurred in mathematics i mm. don't think it did at all there were strong fights 
Well, I just, I'm laughing because my father is a mathematician, so he'd be so happy to hear this question. And I'm also laughing because we were discussing Euclid this morning. <laughs> but I'm talking about Euclid in the context of debates about equality. No, it's a, it's a great question. But I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna punt because I, I, I always made my father ashamed by not being good at math. Hi, thank you for your talk, super interesting. Um, I'm Evie Bailing, I'm a second year graduate student here. Um, uh, I was kind of thinking about, um, I don't know much about Roger Williams beyond what you've spoken of in the talk, and I was just wondering if you see, I guess there's two ways in which I'm wondering if sort of his Christianity, his Christian context specifically informs kind of his his tolerance of toleration, you might say. Um, so I'm wondering if there's a way in which, um, I mean, I guess you mentioned his Augustinianism already, but um, a way in which his sense that there is kind of a world beyond this one that is going to be more complete, like if that kind of enables him to be more tolerant of like vice or evil in this world. And then my second question is like, is there a sense in him that part of the reason uh, for toleration or allowing free descent is that is something about the um, mechanism of conversion that if you, if you try mm -hmm. to force somebody into converting, they're not going to really genuinely adopt the faith. But if you allow this sort of free discourse, then um, obviously I'm not saying that he you know, it's requiring people to convert, but just that there's a way in which respecting the person's freedom kind of uh, to believe what they believe is allowing that space for conversion. So I'm curious if he's informed by either of those perspectives or how he thinks about that. Thank you. Yeah, those are both really important observations and questions. And so I'll just, to the first, I'll just say, Yes, I think eschatology is is relevant here, and I, you know Williams is a kind of millenarian as they as they all are, and I think that maybe you can say, well, all this mere civility business is a bit easier if you think the world's going to end tomorrow, <laughs> so we're not calling on to wait. So, but I want to set that aside. The second question, yeah, I think that's actually what I'm most interested in is um, so I've I've published papers on what I call evangelical toleration. And it's precisely this idea that certain theologies of conversion produce these arguments for, for religious toleration. And, and, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm not an evangelical Christian. Nevertheless, I think that this model of understanding conversion is just really, really helpful because I think it maps on, not perfectly neatly, Linus, but really helpfully to questions about democratic persuasion. So how is it that we come to change our minds? about things, right? Williams will say, changing your mind is not a matter of encountering the knocked on, down argument or the inassail, unassailable authority. This is not how human minds work. There's something about, he says, you know, it's digitus dei. Just sometimes it's a story, it's a person you meet, it's just a dream you had. The conversion experience is not commanded by the, by the words of someone else. Nevertheless, it's the freedom of the word to flow that makes that conversion, the, the possibility of a true conversion possible. And I worry that in um, contemporary complaints about the crisis of civility and kind of our, our, our anxieties about free speech today, that we've sort of learned, we're losing sight of the importance of persuasion to democratic politics. <laughs> the point is to get other people to change their minds, right? And then hopefully in getting them to change their minds, to win the election. The point isn't to cloak ourselves in the solidarity and virtue of the like-minded in our conviction that the people who disagree, us, disagree with us are really, really wrong, right? That might be a great way to feel good about yourself. It's not a good way to win an election, right? And so I, I guess I would want, um, if we're gonna bring the insights from early modern toleration to uh, modern democratic theory, I would want modern day partisans to just be a bit more evangelical. Before we conclude, I just have one quick announcement for our undergraduates. Um, these kind of conversations, these topics are exactly what we are focused on here at the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government. If you're interested in joining our minor, the Constitutional Studies minor, um, registration's right around the corner. Please come talk to me. Uh, we would love to have you. But one more time, uh, let us thank Professor Bejan for her coming all the way out here.